Well, it is my great, absolute pleasure to introduce Gordon and Gail to our Seneca Community Church family. Uh, Gordon and our friendship began, believe it or not, in a little Dunkin' Donuts coffee shop. <laughs> and those of you know that, you know, I, I still went with him early in the morning to Dunkin' Donuts, even though it was a little sketchy, but uh, not my favorite coffee place. But uh, on a leadership retreat, we spent some time together, and that was 16 years ago. Uh, within three months, we found ourselves serving together as co-senior pastors at Centerpoint Church in New Hampshire, and we did that for almost five years together. Uh, Gordon and Gail have served uh, churches together for over 40 years, and they continue to do that. They've written books that have touched uh, countless lives and been life coaches across uh, the spectrum, a wide spectrum of a lot of different people. Uh, Gordon has been the spiritual advisor to the President of the United States, and a number of other amazing things, including he and Gail helping out at Ground Zero right after 9-11. But what really stands out uh, to me is that they are personal friends, they are mentors, uh, they've made a difference in Cindy and my life. Uh, we're better people for having them in our lives. Uh, some of the best stuff you see in us is because of them. And uh, we love them dearly. I, I just... Just even yesterday, hearing his voice speak uh, just, just warms my heart and warms my soul. Uh, in some of the hardest times and sweetest times in life, uh, Gordon has made himself available, and his frankness, his wisdom, and grace continues to have an impact. So thank you, Gordon and Gail, for making the trip out here, and welcome to Seneca Community Church. Give them a warm welcome. Gordon. What kind words. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Gail and I feel a reciprocal feeling about Cindy and David. They've been a much part of our lives for many years, and it's been a rich friendship, and it's also been a rich opportunity to uh, be co-servants of the Lord and uh, to see what it means to grow as the years go by and uh, touch people's lives in the way pastors get to do it. Gail and I are very thankful to be here this weekend. It's been a a weekend that's been talked about over and over again, and we finally were able to put it all together. And David, you're right about the cooking, uh, about the warmth of the people. You're right about the vitality of this church. Uh, everything you said about these people is true. We're very thankful. I'd like to read from the Bible for a moment and uh, to uh, turn your attention to a passage of Scripture, which is printed in your bulletins, and I think will also be on the screen in just a second. It's a, a text of Scripture, nine verses long, which covers one of the great Older Testament stories, which if you did Sunday school, like I did from the first week of my birth, uh, you get to know this story rather quickly. And for me, it's one of my favorite stories, and I suspect in the next few moments, by some things I'll say, you'll understand why I would say that. In Israel's history, uh, there had been a long period of time when the people just turned godless. And in fact, we'll see it in just a moment. There's a phrase in this scripture in which it says, the voice of God, the vision of God was rarely ever heard. So what we're about to read in these eight or nine verses is a moment when God speaks into the life of a nation that's spiritually cold and distant. And he's preparing them for a person who will come on the scene and bring them a fresh word from heaven that should lead to spiritual revival and renewal. You all probably, as I've already said, know the story of Eli and Samuel and the call that God gives to Samuel to become one of Israel's greatest prophets. So imagine for a moment someone says to Samuel years into his prophetic life, how'd you get into this business? Where was the start of all this? And Samuel would say something like this. The boy Samuel was serving God under Eli's direction. Eli is the current high priest at the tabernacle. And it would not be unusual for young men to come and serve and learn and grow under his direction. And by the way, in case you don't remember, Eli is a thoroughly corrupt high priest. He and his sons are abusing organized religion for all kinds of evil purposes. So here's the cleanup moment. 
The boy Samuel was serving God under Eli's direction. This was a time when the revelation of God was rarely heard or seen. Interesting statement. And there are times when we all experience a a period of coldness, of distance, of rebellion, and that's what's going on here. But it's not going on for a few weeks or months. It's been going on for years. One night, when Eli was asleep, his eyesight was very bad. He could hardly see. Sounds like macular degeneration to me. It was well before dawn. The sanctuary lamp was still burning. Samuel was still in bed in the temple of God where the chest or the ark of God rested. Now, by the way, I used to think in my younger years that Samuel is probably a small boy, age four or five, something like that. It never occurred to me that he could be older until I got older. So this Samuel may be 10 years of age, he may be 15 years of age, maybe in his early 20s. All I know is that he is a boy in contrast to Eli's adulthood. It was well before dawn. The sanctuary lamp was still burning. Samuel was in his bed where the chest of God rested. And then God called out. Wonder what that's like. Is it a loudspeaker system? What, what happens when God calls out? Fun discussion to imagine. God calls out, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answers, yes, I am here. And he runs to Eli. I heard your call. Here I am, Eli said. I didn't call you, Eli says. Go back to bed. And so he did. Now, those of you who know this story will know that the story is repeated three times. God called again, Samuel, Samuel. He got up and went to Eli. I heard your call. This is the second time. Here I am. This all happened before Samuel knew God for himself. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a younger person in an institutional religious situation to hear a lot about God talk day after day, but not to realize how God operates? So Samuel got up and went to Eli. This is the second time. You called me. Here I am. That's when it dawned on Eli that God was calling the boy. So Eli directs Samuel, go back and lie down in your bed. If the voice calls again, Say this, speak God, I'm your servant, ready to listen. And Samuel returned to his bed. Now, I think this is a curious story, and I don't have much time to to labor it over, but let me remind you of something that probably most of you already know. I've already said Eli's a very corrupt man. He's been a very poor leader, spiritual leader. And Israel is going down the tubes because of his bad leadership. And yet God uses him to awaken his voice in the life of a boy. If there is no Eli, there will be no Samuel. And if there is no Samuel, pretty soon there will be no Israel. So what's going on in these verses is really, really, really important. If this connection does not work so that Samuel learns how to hear the voice of God, History will be totally different than the way we know it to be. Now, I'd like that thought to sink deeply into each of you. You who are older and more experienced in the faith, you who are younger and who are just coming up into speed as to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. How does a person learn to follow the Lord and hear his voice? The Bible speaks to that over and over again. It gives us very interesting relationships. Moses, for example, to Joshua. Mordecai to the young woman who's the queen, Esther. Elijah to Elisha. Paul to Timothy. Jesus to the Twelve. In every one of those that I've just mentioned, you needed at least two players. You needed someone who instructs the younger, and you have a younger who is willing to listen. I think that's one of the most powerful of all biblical truths. And in that day and age, all the more important because people didn't have books and all the technology that we have today to learn from. Today you can say to somebody, well, here's a book, read that, that'll straighten you out. 
Uh, it doesn't always, but that's the way we often do it. What do you do in a day when you have no books? And the answer is very simple. One person becomes the book, and the other one, in effect, reads the book. Now, the reason I introduced this morning by reminding you of Eli and Samuel and what happened between the two of them is I feel like I'm one of those people who's lived in that kind of a story, and my wager is that many of you would too if you thought about it for very long. Maybe the operational question for a morning like this is, who are the Eli's in your life? As you look back over the 20, the 40, the 70 years that you've lived, who are the people who stand out, who one day said something to you, or they did something that you saw, and from that moment, you were never, ever the same. I suppose we could start out by answering that by saying, well, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who over the years have affected me in one way or the other, have built something in my life. Well, yeah, I understand that. I know the thousand too. But suppose you were to pick out the key people, the indispensable people, the most prominent people who approached you at some point in the living of your years, and when they left you, you were a different human being. At my age, I think about this a lot. I go back across the years and ask myself over and over again, who were the people who touched my life, who stood out, because they did something that left me never again the same? I can think of nine people and I've gone over this and over this again in spare moments, and I keep coming back to the same nine who were Eli's in my 80 years of life. I'd like to tell you about them for a few moments. I'd like to share with you how God used them like God used Eli to speak into the life of the Samuel and see if in any way it arouses you to do similar thinking. When I go back to the nine people who stood out over the years of my life as bringing to me some insight of God's voice, the first one is an older single woman that I came in to meet when I was four, five, six, seven years of age. Her name was Elizabeth McCall. Uh, she loved children. And every week, she would gather a group of us children in the living room of her home and she would have a Bible story for us and a missionary story and a verse to memorize and a song to learn. Every week, we children got together and we heard these stories. I want to tell you, Miss McCall could tell a story as well as Hollywood could ever do it on the screen. I mean, when she told the story of Moses and the burning bush, you could smell the smoke. You felt almost compelled to take your own shoes off because she made it so vivid and so real. When Miss McCall told the story of Jonah and the whale, you knew what it was like to be inside that whale, how it stunk so badly, because she knew how to rivet it into your brain and to your memory. I learned to love the Bible because of Elizabeth McCall. No person has ever really touched me as deeply as she did, as she took the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament and brought them into my mind and into my heart. To this day, when I open the Bible over and over again, there's a little question mark in my head. How would Miss McCall handle this story? And she taught me the value of growing and learning in the Bible. I learned more about the Bible pound for pound from Elizabeth McCall at the age of five than any school I ever went to, including the Graduate School of Theology that I attended many, many years later. We need women, we need men in the Christian movement who know how to represent the Bible and all of its power in the lives of children, as she did for me. The second person who stood out in my life was my grandmother. She lived not far away from where I lived as a child, and so I often found myself visiting at her home. And every time I went to her home, my grandfather was the director of a mission that sent missionaries to Europe, and he was gone almost all the time. So it was grandma and me. And the routine was always the same. We'd get up in the morning and we would have breakfast and then she would open the Bible and she taught me to read 
for the first time at the age of four in the King James Bible, all the letters of St. Paul. She loved Paul. And she was determined that I was going to love Paul too. I hated it. But I knew that when she got through, other things were going to happen that were really good. We would pray for missionaries by the dozens. And then Grandma would lay out in front of me a map of Europe. You have to understand, at my age, these were the days of World War II. And so we would talk about Germany, France, Holland, Norway, Greece. And on this map, she would make me memorize all the major cities of Europe. When I was five years of age, I knew Europe about as well as anybody. I knew the rivers, I knew the cities, I knew the countries, the language groups. And as we learned all these things, she would say to me over and over again, we must pray for this country, we must pray for that country. Now, we were at war with Germany. And my grandmother would say to me day after day, we must pray for the children of Germany. They have no food. Their homes have been destroyed by bombs. Many of them have lost their parents. Pray for these children. God loves these children. And so at the age of four, five, and six, I learned to pray for the children of Germany, Italy, and other places. Gail and I go to Europe quite frequently to speak at various conferences, and particularly we visit Germany all the time. To this day, I did this just a couple of months ago. When I open up and get ready to speak, I'll say to the crowd, if you could imagine it like it is in here, how many of you are my age? Hands go up all over the place. And then I'll say this, I want you to know that when you were a child and our country was at war with your country, I prayed for you. I prayed for the children of Germany. And I love Germany to this day because my grandmother bred it into my heart and my mind to pray for my enemies. Grandma also taught me to love the city. She would take me into Manhattan over and over again, and we saw the parks and the museums and the sculptures on Corner Street. We went to the skyscrapers. We went to all the different factories and stuff that surrounded Manhattan, and she taught me to love the city. And often she would say to me, son, learn to look for the beauty and the glory of God in the city. This is the place where Jesus wants people to know how much he loves them. So to this day, I love the city. I know Manhattan like the back of my hand because at five and six and seven, my grandmother was taking me block by block to show me what a city likes, is like and, and what the people are like. When you have a grandmother like that, it marks your whole life, and you never forget it. The third person who stood out in my life came in my high school years. He was a track and cross country coach and a physics and chemistry professor at the prep school that I attended. He was a man who loved the Lord Jesus deeply, and he was determined that he was going to turn out not only good winning athletes, but that everything we did as athletes would then transfer into our knowing how to live a life before God that was holy and exemplary. I can remember when I first went off to school, 2,000 miles away from my home. My home was not a happy place. And I was looking for people who would show me a better way to understand love and life. And my coach came along. After he'd seen me run for a few days, he invited me to his home for dinner with he and his wife. And after the dinner was over, he reached behind him onto a bookshelf and he brought a little school notebook down before me with my name on the front cover. He turned to the back page and it said, June 1957. And on that page was a whole list of races that I was scheduled to run four years from now and the times that I would be running them. I looked at those times and I said to him, Coach, these times are impossible. I will never run this fast. He said, Watch. And he turned the notebook backwards, page by page, until we finally came 40 months earlier to the place where we were that very evening. And I suddenly realized what he had done. He had built a plan for 40 months of competition. 
Each page was like a stair step showing I was doing better and better and better. And he said to me, Gordon, this is the way we're going to make you into a great athlete. It's also the way we're going to help you to come to know Jesus. Because when Jesus stands out in the lives of people and he calls them to listen to him, it's always step by step and they're growing. And that's what I want to teach you out on the track field so that you will not only be a winning athlete, but you will become step by step by step a man of God. I have rarely ever felt the love of any person in those earlier days of my life like I felt from this coach who was determined every day that he was going to sink himself into his runners and in my particular situation into my life. To this day, even though he's been gone for a long time, I hear his voice in the back of my head spinning out those lessons and those principles of life 60, 65 years ago. They're still there because he stood out. He was my Eli when I was a teenager. Not long after I graduated from school, I came to know another man who was a few years older than me. His first name was Keith. The first thing that I think about any time I think about Keith, who's also gone, well, they're all gone now, was how much he loved Jesus. But his love for Jesus was not a love just in words, but it was a love that came by the way he lived day by day in the details of life. In my early college years, he invited me to share a room in his apartment. He was a single man, and I had a room in this apartment of his. And little did I realize that when I moved in there to stay as a student, that this man was going to help me learn how to grow up. I can still hear his voice. He'd say, Gordon, a young man, when he gets up out of bed in the morning, if he loves the Lord, the first thing he does is make his bed. You haven't made your bed for three days. And when I went into the bathroom to get myself presentable for the day, he would say, Gordon, a man of God puts the toilet seat down when he's finished. A man of God makes sure that he wears clothes that don't smell because he didn't do his laundry. A man of God pays his bills on time. A man of God keeps his promises when he tells people he's going to do things. He does them over and over over again. My friend Keith taught me what it was like to live as a responsible man. Over and over again to this day, I hear Keith's voice in the back of my head telling me things I needed to learn the hard way because I not learned them the regular way in earlier days. I love that man, even though he's gone, because so much of what I became it was because of the instructions he gave me each day as a young college student, how to live responsibly and to take my place in my personal society. Not long after those days, as I moved along in college, I met some other people who stood out in my life. I'm thinking of a couple whose name was Frank and Helen Moss. Frank was a Presbyterian pastor and he and his wife, Helen, lived just a few doors down the street from where my apartment was with Keith. I struck up a friendship with them, just kind of casual, day after day, walking past their home. One of them might be on the front lawn, and we'd stop and talk for a moment. And uh, I, I came to really appreciate their friendships. And one day, Mrs. Moss, Helen Moss, said to me, Gordon, why don't you come over and have supper in our home with Frank and me tomorrow night? well, you're a starving college student who hasn't tasted decent food for a while. You pray about an invitation like that for four seconds, and you hear the will of God quite plainly. <laughs> so I went. The food was wonderful. But what I had not anticipated was sitting at the table and watching these two people relate to each other. I said a moment ago, Please understand, I came from a home where my mother and father did not know how to love each other. I came from a home filled with conflict, from a home where there was rarely any encouragement to grow and to learn. So I'm sitting there watching this man and this woman as the three of us have dinner together, listening to their conversation, 
watching the way they treat each other, the respect, the affection, the wisdom. I had never seen a man treat his wife so lovingly and so tenderly. I had never seen a woman relate to her husband so powerfully, encouraging him, asking him questions, listening carefully to the things that he was thinking about. I sat there just amazed at what love looks like when two people practice it in a marriage. When the evening was over and I got ready to leave, they said, why don't you come back and have dinner with us next week, the same evening? And a week later, I went back. And I saw the same things. I watched the way she would touch him as she went around his chair to get something to bring to the table. I watched the way he would kid her, the way he complimented her, the way he thanked her. It was all new to me. And it was all beautiful to me. They said, why don't you come back next week? Pretty soon I was having dinner at their home two or three nights a week. And I was doing it not because of the food. I wanted to learn from these two people what it looks like to love one another. I remember going home one day, and as I was going, I had left them, and I was on my, home. on my way home. I said to myself, if I ever get married, I want a wife just like Helen. If I ever get married, I want to be a husband just like Frank. If I ever get married, I want to have a marriage like Frank and Helen have grown over the years. It wasn't many months after that that I met Gail. Three weeks after we met, we were engaged, and four months later, we were married. But a lot of the reason that relationship moved so quickly and powerfully is what I had seen in the home of Frank and Helen Moss over those years. Men and women, can I say that to you in this room, those of you who share a marriage? You have no idea how often people are watching and what they learn from each of you by the way you treat each other and serve one another. And they import that and they adapt that, that, adapt that to their own view of what it means to live together in a loving harmony and relationship. There are a couple of other people who stood out in my life as those years went by. One is a man that uh, has been gone now to be with the Lord for several years. His name was Vernon. He was much older than me. He was the president of the place where I ended up going to seminary and have given so much over the years of my life and Gail's life. There was a way in which he had a love for young men and building in their lives, and he particularly seemed to center or focus his attention upon me. The thing that Vernon had growing about him was the way he cared for people. If you came within 10 feet of his circle of attention, he would be with you asking questions, making reference to things he saw in you that God was doing. He was always there imagining what it would be like to grow as a Christian. And over the years that I spent time with Vernon, I discovered that he was more a father than anything I ever knew about fatherhood. I spent hours and hours and hours talking with him. And I learned as that time went by the art of asking questions. You meet people like that every once in a while. They are so good at, at, at showing attention to you and drawing out of you the things that you're most hopeful about, the things you're challenged about, the places where you feel defeated or cold. And my friend Vernon knew how to draw those things out of people. And when they would talk with him, he would be able to offer them things from the scriptures and from life's experience. And he did that for me. He taught me the art of asking questions. He's in heaven today, but I hope that in many, many ways I've kept up his tradition. Every once in a while someone will say to me, boy, you ask questions I never heard about before. You, you really make me think. And I think, no, that's, that's Vernon in me. That's my Eli. 
who taught me one day that the key to human relationships almost always begins with the questions. And when you and I engage in conversations, one of the most important things we can do as we talk with other people is to try to enter into their lives at a deeper level than, than the shallow surface level. To ask questions that draw them out, that helps us to get to know each other. That's a big secret to life. Along with Vernon in those days, as I got out of college and into my earliest years of ministry, was another professor by the name of Bruce. He was a man who saw potential in me as a writer and challenged me to take up the pen and later the computer to try writing articles with the possibility of writing a book or two. He was not easy to please. I would write things for him and he would write C- minus on them. Or in parentheses, you can do better than this. One day he wrote and he said, if I were you and I had written this paper, I'd be ashamed to sign my name to it. Well, he understood that I liked pain. <laughs> uh, that I was one of those people who could stand a little bit of correction if it meant that I was going to be able to grow in my life of serving the Lord. And it was because of his very high standards that little bit by little, my ability to write came out onto the surface and books began to appear and articles of one type or another. To this day, I never write an article or much less a book manuscript that I don't, when I finish it all and I get ready to send it off to the editor, I ask myself, how would Bruce feel about what I've done here? What would be his critique of my grammar, of my logical argument, of the places where I wanted to take the reader to a conclusion? The man lives back there like Eli lived in the back of Samuel's head. He was the man who taught me how to take this gift of writing and perhaps sharpen it up a bit so that it could do good for a few other people who were willing to read it. Those are eight of the nine people in my life who stood out. Let me tell you about one more. The first eight are gone. I'll never see them again until we meet in heaven. The ninth one still lives. She's here in this room today, my wife Gail. Back in the years when I was a college student, uh, my friend Keith was always finding ways to influence my life. He came home to our apartment one day and he said something like this, Gordon, I met a woman today who I think would make you an incredible wife. <laughs> he described her to me in about 15 minutes and when he got through I thought to myself, if she's everything he says she is, she's a combination of Betty Crocker, Mother Teresa, and Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> I said to him, I've got to meet her as soon as I possibly can. He said, Maybe we can get a date to have breakfast with her tomorrow morning. I said, Keith, you don't call a woman at 9 o'clock at night and invite them to breakfast the next morning. He said, watch. <laughs> Five minutes later, he came back. He said, I've talked to her. She's invited us to her apartment tomorrow morning for breakfast at 8 o'clock. 30 minutes after I met Gail that morning, I was in love. Not just because of the way she cooked breakfast, but I discovered almost instantly that God had been shaping the two of us on different pathways to love the same things, to have the same sense of call to ministry, serving people. For the first time, I met someone who was ready to pour herself into my life and encourage me to grow as I would like to do for her. Some weeks after we had met, and we were already planning on a marriage. Uh, Gail came one night to hear me preach for the first time. It was a much smaller crowd than this in a smaller room. She sat in the front row with her Bible open and a notebook taking notes on everything I said. And when the evening was over and the room had emptied, I think very quickly, people wanted out of there as quick as they could go. <laughs> but when the room was empty, she came walking toward me, 
And when she reached me, she threw her arms around my neck. She kissed me. And she said something like this to me in my ear. God has given me a vision tonight of the preacher of the Bible that he wants to make you into. And I'm prepared to support you in any conceivable way that I can. When you meet a person like that, who feels that way, who loves you enough to want to support your growth and the way that God will use you in the coming years, when you meet a person like that, hold on tight. Because that's what God gave me that night, an Eli who helped me to start becoming a preacher of the Bible. A week or two before Gail and I were to be married, my friend Keith, that I've already told you about, took me out to lunch. I look back now some almost 60 years later and realize when he took me out to lunch that day, he was scared. He realized that by introducing me, he had created something he wasn't sure was that ready to go. And I think he had a wonderful confidence in Gail's maturity, but he wasn't so sure about me. <laughs> and after we had ordered our lunch, he leaned across the table and he said something like this, Gordon, God has given to you a remarkable woman to marry. He means to say many things into your life through her. And then he leaned even closer and he took his finger and he put it about an inch away from my nose. And he said loudly, firmly, three times, listen to her, listen to her, listen to her, because you're not a good listener. <laughs> that may have been the most important piece of single advice I ever received in my life. Because for the most part, a few exceptions, I've been listening for almost 60 years. And what I have heard over and over again through this Eli are things that have helped me to grow and to be whatever level of effectiveness I am in the serving of the Lord. If there had been no Gale, there would be no Gordon. So there are nine people who stood out in my life. Nine people, eight in heaven, one here, who if they had not been in the pathway, I would not be with you today. My question to you, as we close this all down, is twofold. Who have been the Eli's in your life? As you look back across the years, who have been the people who brought you a word from God that has made it all the difference today. And when you discover who those few may be, have you ever said thank you to them? Have you ever put on paper or gone to them face to face and say, you know, when you said this, when you did this, when you came alongside in this way, God used you as God used Eli to make me into a Samuel. The second question is not only who have been Eli's to you, but who are you being an Eli in your life so that they too may hear the voice of God. I look across this congregation this morning and I see people of all the diverse age levels. There are those of you who are younger. There are those of you who are middle adults. There are those of you who are the older. Let me say specifically to those of you who are the older, this is the period of time when God calls upon you to be an Eli. Because the future of this church is whether or not there will be some Samuels who come along. And you are the people who make that happen. The stories I've told you this morning, I tell often because they marked my life indelibly. And they illustrate the ways in which God speaks so often to each of us. May we learn powerfully so that the future is full of Samuels because there were a few good Elis. Would you pray with me? 
Father, I thank you for the privilege of speaking to these dear people, many of whom have poured their lives into this church and to this community and have such a hunger to make an impact and effect for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, would you continuously raise up Eli's, who in turn will raise up more Samuel's. This is my prayer for my friends, as much as it is always a prayer for myself. Amen.